Okay, so this series of slides are going to be covering chapter 12, transport across cell membranes. Um, so we want to keep in mind the information that we learned in chapter 11 about cell membranes, phospholipids, and different proteins. Um, and so this, this chapter focuses on the transporters and channels um, that are going to allow for the movement of material from one side of the membrane to the other side of the mem membrane. So we want to keep in mind, you know, last chapter we talked about liposomes, right? And so if we just had a cell made up of um, lipid, the phospholipids, so if we just had this liposome, the only material that would be able to get inside the cell would be ones that would be able to diffuse through that um, phospholipid layer. And that would be really limited. So we can see here in panel A, it's only the purple triangles that are able to move in, but some of these larger molecules or these molecules that have charges aren't able to cross this um, phospholipid layer of the liposome. And so if we see in panel B, we can see if we add these proteins in to help with transport, um, this allows us to bring additional molecules inside the cell, um, but it also can allow us to have a um, change the concentration of these um, molecules that would easily diffuse inside the cell. Okay, so we can see that, you know, we have these transport proteins that are actually going to pump out um, those purple. Um, pump out our purple triangles because we want to have a isotonic solution. We want the concentration to be the same inside or outside the cell. Or if we're trying to create a concentration gradient, maybe we want a higher concentration of them outside the cell. Um, we also have transport proteins that are going to allow those blue circles to come inside um, and out of the cell. And then we also have a transport protein that's going to allow for our green rectangles to go inside the cell. So we want to keep in mind that um, transport isn't always back and forth, that transport proteins can allow for transport in one direction. Um, some transport proteins can allow for transport in other directions. And we'll talk more about how this is achieved, okay? So we want, again, we want to keep in mind that um, for many of our reactions for the generation of energy, we need to have concentration gradient and so ions are one of those that require there to be a concentration gradient um, across the membrane. And so the concentration is going to be higher um, for some of our ions outside the cell, the extracellular, versus inside. Some of those are inverse, right? So we can see here sodium Na um, is going to have a higher concentration outside the cell. So um, that's going to allow us to bring... Um, to more easily bring it into the cell because we're moving down the concentration gradient. Um, but then when we look at things like hydrogen, we can pump that outside of the cell um, against the concentration gradient. Um, so then it has this natural tendency to want to come back in so we can use that to our advantage to create things like ATP um, if we're a bacteria. Um, that can also keep in mind that um, we could be looking at not just plasma membranes, but membranes of like the mitochondria, right? Um, and so important things to note is that these lipid bilayers are highly impermeable to ions. So this allows for controlled movements to um, of them inside or outside the cells so that we can get these different concentration gradients occurring. And the maintenance of these concentration gradients, these ion gradients, um, can be either through passive or active mechanisms. And again, we'll talk more about that um, when we talk about more specific um, transport proteins. So this is a nice um, figure to keep in mind um, because it looks at different molecules and ions um, and their ability to um, move across the membrane, to diffuse across the membrane. So 
we want to keep in mind that the our membranes are selectively permeable, right? So there are certain things like small polar molecules, hydrophobic molecules that are going to be able to move across the membrane, move into um, the cell relatively easily. So things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, um, some of our steroid hormones are going to be able to diffuse across and enter in the cell relatively easily. So they're considered highly permeable. Where when we look at the other extreme, when we look at the ions, as we just mentioned, these are not going to be permeable. Um, and again, that's because we want to be able to control the gradient that's going to be created because we want to be able to, um, we want those ions to move through transport proteins so we can use that energy, um, that movement of that ion across the gradient to create energy to catalyze reactions. Okay, we're also going to have large, um, large and small uncharged um, polar um, molecules, and your larger ones are going to be less permeable than smaller ones, right? So smaller molecules like water, urea. Um, glycerol are going to be more likely to be able to get across the membrane um, but for many cases this is where we might have a channel a pore to allow them to enter so we'll look at the channel um, aquaporin um, that allows water to enter in right so um, it's water is not going to readily diffuse across the membrane like smaller nonpolar molecules okay larger um, polar molecules are going to require transporters to get them across because they're going to be too big to squeeze through that space of the plasma, the um, phospholipids of the plasma membrane. And so transporting them across using um, transporters to do that um, would be a way to get them inside the cell. Um, this also allows us to kind of count and regulate um, some of the expression of other enzymes that are going to be important in their metabol in metabolizing and utilizing those larger molecules um, because we can kind of count them as they're coming in through the receptors. So when we look at permeability, um, when proteins are involved, um, we can have transporters or channels. So transporters are going to specifically bind to a substrate or a solute and um, generally due to conformational or structural changes in that transporter, it then moves it inside the cell. And we'll look at that in a moment, some of this conformational changes that can occur. But again, keep in mind that this is kind of like is a controlled movement through. With channels, these are going to create pores, and these pores are large enough, these holes are large enough for the molecule to move through. Um, so there's not the structural change. Um, the channel is created, and the hole in the channel allows for the movement of the solute. Um, kind of the substrate, the molecule um, that the channel is designed for to move through. Okay, so we'll look at an example of a channel first. And so kind of our traditional example of a channel would be the aquaporins. Um, so these images, um, you have similar images in your textbook looking at aquaporins, um, but these are pulled from an actual the research paper. So they look a little bit different. They're not as cartoon drawing because they're actually what the aquaporin looks like. So you can see in panel A, um, in the upper left hand, we have four subunits that are going to create these pore regions, but then we also have this central cavity that's created. Um, just below that, you can see the space filled model, um, which is kind of like a cross section of the aquaporin and you can see the water molecules moving through. So you can see those red dots with two blue. Um, so our oxygen and our two hydrogens. And you can see how they are moving through that channel that's being created. 
you also have a nice ribbon model um, showing those alpha helixes that create um, the aquaporin. Um, and again, it's four um, subunits coming together to create that. And it gets embedded, it goes transmembrane through the pla um, plasma mem membrane, and you can see that in panel B. So again, you can see very similar images if you look at your textbook that are um, kind of simplified to show that. The um, last kind of figure I want to um, panel that I want to point out is this image um, that's on the lower right hand side. And so your textbook has a similar one except it's turned, um, the colors are altered so that it has a blue um, shading to it, not this black and red shading. Um, so I think they, they changed the color because they wanted it, they wanted you to think more of like water moving through. Um, so all this, um, the kind of red cloud at the top and bottom and those channels in between are water molecules. The area that is dark between those that top and bottom cloud um, is where the plasma membrane is. And so we can we can see, hopefully, um, where we would have our plasma membrane and then incorporated in there is our aquaporin. And then we have that movement of the water through those channels. Okay, um, so again, this is a nice example of a channel, um, and I think this paper from 2001 does a nice job in giving you visuals of how that aquaporin comes together to create those channels, and um, I do specifically like um, the image on the bottom on the left hand side showing the water molecules moving through the aquaporin but also the image on the right showing the movement of the water through those columns um, and again th this image on the lower right is in your textbook it's just the colors have been changed um, because the authors of the textbook feel that's better a better visual so if the your textbook pictures help you understand aquaporin go for it. Um, I just wanted you to understand where those images are coming from. What is the science? What are the articles? What's the research being done to show that? And the kind of transition from what figures, what the um, information looks like in a research article versus when it goes to a textbook, um, which is for a wider audience generally. Okay. Um, I did post this article up onto our D2L, um, so it's under the files for Unit 2, so you can view that. There's additional figures in there, um, but again, this, these are kind of the key figures and panels um, that I thought were relevant. So now looking at transporters, um, so transporters on like channels are going to have conformational change. So here we can see how um, this transporter, you know, is going to have an A state versus a B state. And so when the solute comes in, it's going to be able to bind to that binding site. And that binding actually initiates a change in that transporter. So it actually kind of closes on the outside and opens on the inside, so it kind of inverts, right? And this allows then the solute, the substrate, to move into the cell. Um, this is, in this example, this is moving with the concentration gradient, so no energy is needed um, in order for this to happen. Once that solute, once the substrate unbinds from the transporter, it's now inside the cell. That unbinding triggers the transporter to go back to state A, where it's going to be open on the outside and closed on the inside. Those binding sites are empty. So now because of there's a high concentration of the solute on the outside, it's going to be likely to bind to the transporter and the binding site again, again inducing a conformational change to state B so that the solute is brought inside. Okay, so this um, using transporter 
are going to increase the rate of transport versus simple diffusion, right? So simple diffusion for this to occur because these are larger molecules, it would be extremely slow in order for these molecules to make it across um, the plasma membrane or across the membranes. And so the transporter increases the rate in which it's going to be tra um, transported in. Eventually your concentration gradient would be equal and so you'd reach isotonic and so this wouldn't become as efficient and so that's why it starts to kind of plateau out. So as an example of a conformational change, the lactulose transporter, as you can see in this image, um, on the left hand side this would be equivalent to the A state. You can see how it's going to be open on the extracellular side, on the outside. So this allows for lactulose and a hydrogen ion to bind. When we have this binding occurring, then we have this shifting of these subunits, of these alpha helixes, so that they're now closed on the extracellular side, and they're now open on the cytosol side, on the internal side. And so this would then allow the lactulose to come in. Um, just an important thing to note is that hydrogen is acting as a cofactor allowing for conformational changes to occur that make lactulose more likely to bind um, and we'll look more at this interaction but again this was a nice um, visual of how these conformational changes occur in a transporter that once a substrate like lactulose binds it causes a conformational changes a shift right because we have these bindings and it's going to change basically how these proteins are kind of folding and interacting and so that causes these sub two subunits to close on one side on the um, extracellular side so that it opens on the cytosolic side in case it becomes it's kind of it's kind of like two seesaws working together. So we want to keep in mind that membrane permeability can either be a passive or an active process. So um, in this figure we're looking at um, this this idea, this concept. Um, so yes, we can have um, molecules that simply will diffuse across, um, so those nonpolar molecules. But for polar molecules, larger molecules, we need these tr either channels or transporters for this occur. And if, um, if this is done passively, the easiest way to tell that is that there's not going to be ATP energy utilized in that process, okay? Um, and so again, for our channel, like our transport of water, we're not going to use um, we're not going to use ATP or energy in order to do that. So that would be passive. And then for a number of transporters, um, this is can be done passive. We can also have active transport through transporters. So some transporters do require energy in order for transport of the um, of the molecule across the membrane. And keep in mind that this direction, um, it could be in either direction. Usually if it's active transport, it's because we're going across a concentration gradient. So we can see in this figure, on the right hand side, we have our concentration gradient. And if we look at the green squares, the green, score, square, green squares are at a higher concentration outside the cell. So if we were to try to move this molecule outside the cell, we're going across against the concentration gradient. Um, so there's going to have to be energy in order to do that. Our other examples with our red circle or yellow circle and our blue circle, the, we were going with the concentration gradient. So we were going from a high concentration outside the cell to a low concentration inside the cell. And so this can be done without energy being required. Okay. So another concept um, in this chapter looks at electrochemical gradients and how they work in combination with um, concentration gradients. And so with electrochemical gradients, there's two components to it, the electrical charge of the membrane and then the ion that's moving across the membrane. Um, and so there's 
three different um, events that can happen. So we can have an electrochemical gradient, but there's no membrane potential, we, which is shown on the left. In the middle, we have the electrochemical gradient with a membrane potential that's negative on the inside, or we can have an electron um, chemical gradient with the membrane potential that's positive on the inside. Um, this concept of electrochemical gradients becomes really important in some of the biological processes we'll talk about later on as far as the action potentials um, being generated so that we can have like synapses, um, muscle contractions and such. So important concept that you'll see in other classes like anatomy and physiology um, when we're looking at biological systems um, as a whole. So when we're looking at active transports, um, these pumps can work in three main ways. Um, so we talked about ATP-driven pumps, um, that being where they're getting the energy from. So where we have, in order to move across the constant um, across the concentration gradient, so from a low concentration to a high concentration gradient, we would need ATP, which is converted into ADP. That phosphate allows um, that pump to pump out the substrate, um, the molecule that's being transported. We can also have coupled transporters, um, as you see in the left, um, and so these can either be um, where molecules are moving together in the same direction, symport, or they can be antiport where they're moving in opposite directions. Um, but with coupled transport, because of another ion or molecule moving with it, um, you can move across the concentration gradient. Um, so you're using utilizing that. Um, kind of energy in order to do that. And then the last way is using light as energy. And so a light driven pump will use the energy from the light to allow movement um, through. So Rhodopsin um, channel is a light driven pump. So for concentration driven pumps, um, Again, they can be at, for when we have them being coupled, they can either be symport. Again, this is where they're going to be moving in the same direction. Um, so we'd have these coupled, these two transport mole two molecules or ions that are being transported across, and they're moving in the same direction. Antiport, they would be moving in opposite direction. Um, and with our concentration. Um, driven pumps, we can also have uniport um, where a single molecule is being moved across. Okay, so just keep in mind when we're talking about transport across um, uniport where we have a single molecule moving across. Um, so our first view, that, like in our early slides where we had a transporter, when we look at coupled transport where we have two ions moving, we can either have them symport or antiport. Okay, and so to give you an example of some of these transporters, more specifically a symport, we are going to look at sodium glucose symports. So, so sodium glucose symports are also known as SGLT. Um, so S for sodium. GL for glucose and T for transporter. Okay, so these work as a sim port, so they're going to be moving in the same direction. The name tells us that sodium and glucose are going to be involved. And so, um, just like we had said before with transporters, we're going to have a conformational change in order for this to occur. So, lots of moving pieces in this that we want to keep in in mind when we're looking at this example. So on the left hand side we can see where our transporter here is open to the extracellular space. So what's going to happen is our ion is moving down the concentration gradient so we're moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. So this is a natural um, 
movement from outside the cell to inside the cell for it. However, glucose is moving against the concentration gradient, so we're going from a high concentration inside the cell to a low concentration um, outside, so we want to bring more glucose in. And so in order to do that, it needs a little bit of help. And the way it gets that help is through that sodium. So what happens is the sodium is going to bind to its binding site that actually causes conformational changes to the solute binding site, the glucose binding site, which makes that more favorable. When both these sites are bound, both the sodium and the glucose, it causes conformational changes that causes that um, causes the transporter to move from the A state to the B state, B state being closed on the extracellular side and open on the intercellular side, the cytosolic side. This allows the sodium and the glucose to move inside the cell. Okay, um, so now we have glu more glucose inside the cell. Okay, so we've accomplished that goal. So, you know, if we think about this from, um, you know, a cell perspective, you know, we want to bring more glucose in when glucose is available. Um, and again, this isn't um, because glucose would be in a, low a lower concentration on the outside of the cell. This is not something that can easily diffuse across. We need to either, you know, provide, we need to couple this with something. And so because sodium is at a higher concentration, it has a more natural tendency to go into. Okay. Now, it is important to note that both, because this is a coupled transporter, both of these um, molecules need to be present. So if we don't have sodium, we wouldn't get transport of glucose. Okay, so that is important to note. One important, One important task, task for cells, for cells lining, lining the lumen, the lumen of, the of the gut is the uptake, is the uptake of, glucose of glucose produced by digestion of food. Okay, Yet so glucose is typically higher in concentration video, inside the cells um, than in the gut, in and therefore transporting it into the cell requires energy. D2L, to this end, um, a glucose sodium symport harvests folder, the energy stored um, in the sodium the gradient so to pump glucose into the cell. Um, the next slide actually according to one model, gives you a sodium and glucose can both bind to the pump, about, but the binding so, of one makes the binding of the other um, more effective. That video when the binding sites of the symport are open to the um, lumen of the gut, the high sodium concentration makes sodium very likely to bind, and, and thus glucose bring, will bind more efficiently. Because the conformational change of the transporter will only occur occur when both um, sodium, sodium and glucose binding sites are filled. Low, both solutes are transported the across the so membrane in strict unison the and are released together the into, the cell. into the cell. On the cytosolic glucose side of the membrane, the, the solutes gradient. could, in principle, so also in, like, bind and thus be exported the again by the same route that brought them into the cell. We want to bring in that inside However, the cell, but we while there is plenty of glucose inside the cell, there is very little sodium. Therefore, the binding of both types of solutes only occurs very rarely such that most and of the so glucose molecules that, that enter the cell will not leave by the same route. The import is therefore unidirectional. The, the sodium gradient to be able to bring the glucose in. Now once the glucose is inside the cell, we're at a high concentration. Now the epithelial cells lining the intestinal tract um, are the ones that are going to be able to take up the glucose that you eat, right? So that's their job is to absorb. It's got the microvilli there. There's just they are designed to absorb. But they have to deliver the nutrients to other cells um, and into the blood. And so the movement from the high glucose concentration inside the epithelial cells to that basal side, where it's going to be a low concentration, is with the concentration gradient. So we don't need to utilize um, sodium in this case because this is going with the concentration gradient. So the, res the transporter on the basal side of the epithelial cells is different. It's known as GLUT um, transporter um, because it's just glucose transporter. There's no sodium being coupled with it. Okay, so one of the things I, you know, put in asterisk here is the they, they could have done a nicer job of showing the difference between these transporters. So if you look very closely, you can see that um, 
the sodium glucose um, symport it has two binding sites, so it is different than our um, glucose transporter, our glute transporter at the basement um, basal domain, the basal um, side of our epithelial cells. So this only has a binding site for the glucose, um, but I don't know, different. Um, the newer edition of the textbook has it in a slightly different shade of green. So I understand why they were trying to stick with green, but um, just be aware that, again, on the apical side, we had the SGLT transporter, which is the sodium glucose symport transporter. And then on the basal side, we have um, a uniport. Um, so where we have a single, just the glucose being transported across. And that's, those are known as glute um, transporters. And so glute, there are a number of different glute transporters. So there's glute one, glute two, um, there's like a four or a five and a six, I believe. Um, so different cell types have different glute transporters. Um, so there's slight differences in their sequences. And so there'd be slight differences in their efficiency of being able to transport glucose um, outside of the cell. Okay, you will notice that there is the sodium potassium pump. So this is gonna allow for kind of a resetting of the sodium concentration inside the cell. Okay, so we brought sodium in, but we actually wanna make sure we have a low concentration of sodium inside the cell, so we want to make sure we get that out. So coupling in an anti-port, um, like the sodium potassium pump, allows to pump the sodium out as the potassium is coming in. Okay, so um, this figure nicely demonstrates our uniport, a symport, and an anti-port. Okay. So when we're looking at ATP-driven pumps more closely, um, we can divide these pumps into three categories. There's a P-type pump, an F-type, and also V-type proton pump, and an ABC transporter. Okay, um, So be aware that your textbook, at least the fifth edition that I have, doesn't have this in it. Um, so this is from a different textbook and this is, um, I am including this merely so you have an understanding that when we're talking about um, active transport and more specifically when we're talking about the ATP driven pumps that you understand that there are subsets within that. Um, and so how a calcium pump works, which is a P type pump is different than how an F type proton pump like ATP synthase works. And furthermore, an ABC transporter, which is like the drug pumps that are found in bacteria that pump drugs like antibiotics out of the bacteria so they can't work, is different. And so, um, again, the, there are, they're all ATP driven. Um, but how they're actually able to function is slightly different. Okay, so for our P-type pumps, this is where they are going to be pumping ions out of the cell. Okay, so this allows for maintaining of these membrane potentials. So they're kind of helping to reset. Okay, um, with our proton pumps, these are working in the reverse direction. So we're actually going to be bringing ions in and this is a way to actually generate energy right so we move the protons um, if we move the hydrogen the proton back into the cell we can actually create ATP okay so you can kind of think of um, P type and F type as yin and yang and they're working together right so P, P types are going to use ATP where F types are going to generate ATP. Okay. Now, when we look at ABC transporter, this is where we're going to have small molecules moving across. Um, so it's not ions. Okay. So again, these small molecules might be um, 
a drug, an antibiotic, um, which would be harmful, or a toxin, which would be harmful to the cell. And so it, the cell wants to get rid of that small molecule. And so it's going to utilize ATP in order to do that. Okay, um, but it's not ions that are moving across. And so next we're going to look at ion channels. Um, so ion channels are going to be specific to a specific ion. So they're ion selective and they can move from a open closed state. Okay, and so when it is open, this allows the ion to move through. So this is another video that I will post up onto the D2L um, Unit 2 files. And so this just gives us a visual of the potassium channel um, and how it in the video, they're gonna they show you um, how that channel allows for potassium to go through, but other ions such as sodium are going to be too small to actually move through that. And so our next slide looks at demonstrating that through um, figures. So here, um, if we look at our potassium channel, you can see how we have our alpha helixes, and what happens is it actually creates this pore, um, and that we have this selectivity loop. And so these selectivity loops, there's actually four of them, and so um, those selectivity loops allow for um, the ion to interact with it, and move through. And so potassium is the right size that when it's going down the middle, it is actually going to feel force between all four of these selectivity loops. And so the natural tendency is for it to move through that channel, through that pore. Now, if it's a smaller ion like sodium, it's not going to end up having even distribution of those forces from the selectivity loop. So it would end up being off balance, off tilted, and so there's not gonna be that movement of it through the channel, okay? So this is demonstrates how these channels can be selective and allowing um, different ions, you know, even though, you know, they have the same charge, the size of them are gonna be, is gonna be different, and so that will allow the selectivity. So, okay, so I would say this is the point in this audio lecture that hopefully, you know, everybody has an understanding of slides 1 through 19. Um, and that lays the foundation for what we're going to talk about in this kind of second half of this audio lecture. The concepts that are in the second half of this audio lecture are... Um, tend to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so these are the ones that I would expect that I'm gonna have questions, students are gonna have questions about. Um, so please contact me if you're not understanding um, these concepts. Um, sometimes these concepts, people, students have issues with these concepts because um, we actually try to kind of overcomplicate it. So hopefully um, I will give you, hopefully you have a strong enough background on these transporters um, from the beginning part of this lecture, um, that if we think about these uh, as transporters, as movement of these ions, um, these concepts in the second half of the lecture are a little bit under, un easier to understand. Um, and so in this slide, we are looking at the concept of membrane potential, okay? And so on our left panel here, we have it so that if we looked at our ions, we would actually have an equal amount of positive and negative ions on both sides of the membrane. This would give us a membrane potential of zero. Okay. Well, the reality is that for animal cells, the most membranes have a resting membrane potential, meaning um, that there's going to be a difference between the number of ions 
on um, the charge on one side of the membrane versus the other. So it's not going to be equal amounts of positive and negatives. And so on the right side of our panel, we can see how movement of some of these positive ions um, from the right to the left, that actually causes those negative ions to move also. And so we end up setting up a membrane potential. Okay, so the membrane potential is no longer at zero. Um, and so we would generate a membrane potential here and we can use that concentration gradient to our advantage. Okay, and so the resting membrane potential of a cell depends upon the organism and the cell type. So each cell is going to have kind of its norm for a resting potential. Okay, and so the NERST equation, which we'll look at next, um, looks to quantify um, how equilibrium tries to get met. Okay. So there's different um, deviations of the NERST equation. Um, so you, you can see in the top. So if we look at the NERST equation um, up on the top, um, this includes a number of different constants, like gas constants, um, Faraday's constants. Um, we also have the absolute temperature and um, valence charge of the ion. If we make some assumptions, um, we end up with the equation that's on the bottom. So if we assume that we have a single positive charge and that the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, um, again, we can simplify our equation. Um, what I would like you to take home from the NERSE equation is that what we're looking at is extracellular the ratio of extracellular to intercellular concentration of an ion, right? To determine what the equilibrium potential or the membrane potential would be for that environment, for that ion, okay? Um, so you should be aware of the NERST equation. Um, and again, the idea that there are a number of constants in it. And so if we know what our concentration of an ion is, um, inside the cell and outside the cell, which could be measured, we can determine our um, equilibrium potential. Inversely, if we know the equilibrium potential um, and we know the concentration in one location, we could determine the concentration in the other location. Okay, so that's what I want to say about the NERST equation. So when we look at these ion channels, some of these ion channels may be gated. Um, and so they can be gated by voltage. And so depending upon the charge around them could determine whether they're going to be open or closed. Um, some of these might be ligand gated. Um, and they could either be ligand gated by an extracellular, which we see in that left example of our blue. So if the ligand binds on the extracellular side of the gate, it opens it up. Um, we could also have an intracellular ligand, which is going to bind on the intracellular side. And so if it binds, channel um, would um, open. Okay, And then we can have a mechanical gate that allows for the opening and closing. Okay, So looking at ion channels, um, and to kind of add a, another technique in our repertoire of techniques for learning, um, we can look at patch clamp. Um, so patch clamp can be done in a number of different fashions. Um, so we can have it where the whole the cell is attached and um, the patch, the clamp is applied onto an area of that cell onto a channel. Um, so our patch clamp is small enough that we're only getting like a single channel. So we can actually measure um, the movement of ions of the charge across that single channel. We can also um, remove part of the membrane so that we would only, um, so we're not looking at the whole cell, we're just looking at what that channel would do in an environment that we're controlling. Um, so obviously you, you can control the environment of a cell to some degree, um, but there's going to be more variabilities if we have the cell attached. 
Okay, so we can do like a whole cell recording versus just a um, um, environmental single um, single cell partial membrane. Okay, um, this clamp is um, attached to a computer system and to a voltage meter, um, similar to like if you, you know, no electrician or you know you, you do you want to check to see whether a wire is live you might have a voltage meter um, it's kind of similar device um, is utilized obviously one that's ultra sensitive because the voltage going through like a oh, electrical wire is going to be different than the voltage going through like a single channel um, but it's the same kind of premise that it's actually um, checking for the movements of ions through the channel and changes. So in patch clamp what you end up with is with these recordings that you're seeing here um, and so using this recording using looking at the changes of um, the altitude we can determine whether the channel is opening closed in the frequency of it um, opening and closing okay and so you can see here um, when we're at zero um, this is when the channel is closed, but then we have this flux um, of ions through, and so that has this as a negative um, amplitude, and so that would be when the channel is open. So again, if we look at this recording, we can visualize this channel closed, open, closed, open, closed, open. It's thinking about open and closed. <laughs> open, closed. Okay. Um, and when we look at an action potential, it's the sum of all of the ion channels. Um, and so this is, with this patch clamp, we're looking at a single channel. And with an action potential, we're looking at a collection of channels um, to create, to generate this membrane potential. So patch clamps and looking at action potentials, um, are, are some are sometimes run on neurons so if we look at the basic structure of a neuron we have our cell body and our dendrites and so information signals are going to come in through the dendrites and then we have our axon and this is where our action potential is going to be generated and our axon can either be like one millimeter or one meter in length um, so Organisms like squid have extremely long axons, um, so we can look at the electrical signal and the action potentials that are generated across these axons. Um, and then that branches out um, to the terminal branches of the axon. Those terminal branches would then be connected on the other end to another neuron or um, to muscle fibers, um, where we're going to get at the end point some kind of action, some kind of um, response. The fun so in this video, they're just going through the process of looking at these voltage gates um, in the axon. Um, so I will post that video up. I'm going to move to our next slide just to talk about this a little bit more. So with um, voltage gate channels um, that are going to generate action potentials, these have to be in responsive cells or excitable excitable cells and so things like neurons, muscle cells, endocrine cells, um, egg cells have the ability to generate these action potentials. Okay and so when a stimuli um, is given to them um, this can trigger those channels to open. Okay allowing for a flux of cations of ions through like potassium um, and this then moves down the length of the ion so if we look at this setup we can actually have patch clamps along the length of the axon and we can measure the depolarization that is occurring um, and so here we see where we have this patch clamp, three patch clamps on this axon along the length, and that um, the time that's being measured is milliseconds. So this isn't something visually we'd be able 
to see, but because this is being measured through compu a computer um, and software, um, they're able to detect this time difference between the um, depolarization of a channel at our first clamp versus the second clamp versus the third clamp. Okay, so to look at, in the reality is there's channels all in between these clamps. So if we look at our next figure, um, so looking at this nerve impulse, um, if we're looking at our top figure, we can imagine that this area, the blue, one of um, this is where our patch, first patch clamp would be, um, and then we have our additional patch clamps further down. And so we have this positive charge being generated on the outside of the membrane, where we have the you know the white along our axon, and this is going to be generated because of that potassium leaking. Um, and then as we have our channels, we can see how our channels are closed. These are our, our sodium channels, right? Because sodium is going to be at a high concentration outside. So it's going to want to come in. And so we have our closed channel. Um, and then as we're following this along, we end up with our open channel that's going to allow the sodium to enter inside the cell. So we see that we have this change from the membrane being positive on the outside to the membrane being positive on the inside because we've brought these sodium inside, right? So now that we've opened the channel, this actually starts to cause this propagation and causing other channels to become open allowing the sodium to continue to flux in to and changing that membrane potential as it's moving down okay so that again if we had multiple clamps along this axon we would be able to see that we'd have an opening at our first one and that eventually an opening at our second one and again eventually is less than a millisecond. Um, so this propagation, this spreading because of this char changing of the charge in going from a closed um, to an inactive um, open state. Okay, so we're gonna look next look a little bit closer at um, these channels and how they're being controlled, okay. So when we look at the mechanism of these, the sodium channel um, going from a open, inactive, closed state, um, we want to keep in mind also the membrane and whether it's polar. And so in the closed state, again, we're going to have the membrane on the outside having a positive charge. Um, we'd have our sodium ions present there, negative charge. Um, when the membrane depolarizes and we move into that open state, that's where we're going to get the flux of the sodium in. So we go from the positive charge to the negative charge on the extracellular side, okay? Um, because we have this flux of sodium into through the channel we're now going to have a change in that membrane right because it's depolarized after the sodiums come in the channel becomes inactive um, and so it actually has um, these appendages and they're going to come in and block the sodium channel um, this allows the membrane potential to reset and polarize and so the channel goes into a closed state so there's really three states right so we have an open state allows sodium in inactive and then close and during the inactive we still have the membrane depolarized so it hasn't gone back to the polarized state um, but the channel is not open either To help in this process of having the action potential propagate along 
neurons. Um, neurons are myelinated. Um, and so this myelination, it's almost like an insulation of the, of the nerve cell. Um, so glial cells are going to produce myelin, and the myelin then um, coats it. Again, like insulates it. So again, you can think of this like as an electrical wire. And so this is where this action potential can actually um, propagate much quicker and more efficiently because it's being insulated. And so you don't have um, those ions um, being able to move away from the membranes as easily because we have that insulation occurring. So just like if you had insulation on the wire, if you touch that area where it's insulated, you don't feel that electrical, um, the electricity spreading, but it's still there, but it's just right there with the axon. So this image just shows you an electron um, micrograph transmission, electron micrograph of glial cells being wrapping around the axon. So we see the axon here um, labeled, but then we have this accessory cell, the glial cell, that produces the myelin insulating that axon. So when we look at these axons, um, there are going to be areas where we don't have the glial cells, where we don't have the myelin sheath. Um, and so we can see that in the green here. These are known as the nodes of Rambier. Um, so we can see in the amyofluorescence panel, this they've also stained this um, with the a green um, for the sodium channels, right? So we can see the sodium channels present um, in this area. Neurons, Neurons transmit, transmit chemical. So if we, if you should view that video. What that video talks about is the idea of presynaptic and postsynaptic cells um, so that this allows the action potential to go from one neuron to another neuron. And so um, the synapse allows for a jumping of this electrical signal, but it takes the electrical signal from the action potential because of the sodium ions moving in and transfer this transfers this into a chemical signal through the synapses. Okay. So what in the video they look at is presynaptic and postsynaptic. Okay, so presynaptic is where the signal is actually going to be coming from. And the easiest way to determine which one is presynaptic is where do we see vesicles? Um, and these vesicles on transmission electron micrograph are going to like look like little dots, circles. Okay, so you should be able to see that um, on the upper left hand side we have our membrane, we have these little inside that cell, we have these little vesicles. Those vesicles are going to contain neurotransmitters. So this would be a presynaptic cell. The cell that is to the right of it, um, where we don't see a high number of these vesicles present, this would be our postsynaptical. So this is going to be the receiver of these neurotransmitters so that we can take the neurotransmitter and then regenerate an action potential. Okay. So again, the top left, if we have a presynaptic, then we have a postsynaptic. And then if we move to the bottom right corner, we actually have another presynaptic um, cell. And so either one of these presynaptic cells could receive an action potential. So a stimuli generates into an action potential because sodium channels open, allows sodium to flux in, causes a change to the membrane potential, and it propagates down. Um, and then to make the signal continue to pass this information, right, because signal started all this, to take that and to move that onto the next cell, we need to have the postsynaptic cell that's going to receive that transmission, the neurotransmitters. So um, this is just showing you that um, 
synapse. So the synapse um, is going to be between two cells. Okay. Um, so there's a space, a synaptic cleft between there. So we have our presynaptic cell that's going to have the neurotransmitters in these vesicles, synaptic vesicles. So the neurotransmitter, the vesicles are going to undergo exocytosis. So they're going to fuse with the plasma membrane and release that material into that synaptic cleft. We then have our transmitter gated ion channel, right? So when that neurotransmitter binds to the extracellular side of that gated ion channel, it is going to cause that gate to open. So we can see that in the lower panel where we have the gate is now open. So this is gonna allow sodium to enter in. We'll get the depolarization and then the propagation of the action potential. So we do want to keep in mind that these gated ion channels can either be excitatory or inhibitory. So looking at the neurotransmitters um, that will move from the presynaptic um, cells to the postsynaptic cells, they can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Um, so with an excitatory, they're going to open up sodium or calcium channels. Um, so things like serotonin, acetylcholine. Um, we can also have an inhibitory, and so these are going to open up potassium or chlorine channels, right, to reset, to not allow for um, that action potential to be generated. And so GABA would be an example, or glycerin. Um, and we also have synaptic transmission that can be modulated by co-transmitters. Um, so these are going to bind to G protein coupled receptors such as nitric oxide or neuropeptides. Um, so we'll talk about some of these um, G protein coupled receptors later on in the semester when we talk about cell signaling. Okay, so again, um, just adding to the complexity of action potentials, um, you should just be aware. You know, we have neurotransmitters; those are going to get um, those are going to move across the synaptic. Um, move across the synapse into the synaptic cleft and depending upon what channel they bind to and open will end up giving you a difference in response because whether you'll be able to generate an action potential or whether you will not be able to generate an action potential okay Okay, and so once a neurotransmitter has been released into that uh, into the synapse, um, what can happen is they can either be degraded or they can be transported back to this um, presynaptic uh, nerve, um, so they can undergo or endocytosis back in, and vessels would be formed. And so, keep in mind that. Certain drugs are going to actually affect um, how these neurotransmitters work. So keep in mind, GABA is an inhibitor. So barbiturates are an antagonist. Um, so they're going to mimic the effect of GABA. So we're going to have a more inhibitory effect. Um, Prozac is an inhibitor of serotonin. Um, reuptake. So once serotonin has been released, which is an ex, um, excited, excitatory neurotransmitter, um, once that's been released, it's going. Prozac doesn't allow for the reuptake of it. So you've, in a way, kind of depleted your serotonin. Um, so it decreases the ability to um, excite to generate these action potentials. Now, one synapse um, that is biologically of importance, um, so if you're studying a &P, you'll definitely talk about neuromuscular junctions, then you talk about skeletal muscles, um, and so these have specialized um, chemical synapses. So this is where we have, neuro with a neuromuscular junction, we have neuron, neural tissue, and muscular tissue, um, coming together. 
Um, so the presynaptic piece is going to be neural, and the postsynaptic piece um, cell is going to be muscular. And so that controlling the motion of um, skeletal muscle is achieved through these neuromuscular junctions. Um, unconsciously, this is also our smooth muscles are controlled in this way too. So our muscles are going to have nerves innervating them. The neurotransmitter is going to be acetylchlorine. And so the muscles have receptors that allow for the recognition um, and the opening of channels so that um, we can get depolarization of the muscle membrane um, and allow for contraction of the muscle fibers to occur. So if we look at the mechanism of muscle depolarization, um, we can look at it as a five-step process. So we have our axon, we're at the terminus of the axon, and so we're going to get depolarization. So we've had this um, action potential generated along the axon. It's now gotten to the terminal end, so we're going to have acetylchlorine um, being released by um, that neural, the axon. We're going to have receptors on the muscle side that are going to be able to bind the acetylchlorine, and this causes um, the sodium um, channels to open, so an influx of sodium comes in. This is, causes a depolarization, and neighboring sodium channels are going to open. Because of this depolarization, we're then going to get calcium channels to open. Um, and then with the calcium channels open, calcium is able to flux into the sarcoplasm reticulum, so a specialized um, feature that we see in muscle. And because of that flux of the calcium in, this now allows for the muscle fibers to contract. Okay. Um, so again, um, complex um, process, but if we think about the channels opening. <clears throat> what we're seeing here is this, we're seeing um, channels, one that is a ligand gated channel, right? So our acetylcholine um, channel is gated um, because the ligand, the neurotransmitter binds to it and it opens it up. And then we have these neighboring sodium channels that are voltage gated. And so when we get that depolarization of the membrane, that changing of the positive um, membrane on the outside, that becomes negative, um, that causes those channels to open. Okay. So so again, just think about these different channels and how they're being controlled, okay? To kind of link it back to that beginning of the lecture. So when we look at the acetylcholine um, receptors, it's a pentamer that makes it up. And so we can see that we have five subunits. Um, so we have two alpha subunits and or three additional subunits. And you can see that um, in the transmembrane, domains, we have our alpha helixes, but we also have some beta sheets in our extracellular domains of those um, subunits, okay? And so what happens is that there's a binding site, and again, acetylcholine is going to bind to that binding site, and it causes a conformational change that then opens up, okay? It opens will open up the takes these extracellular domains and bends those back so now the channel is open so that we can have influx of our sodium um, and then as our neurotransmitter dissociates um, it becomes closed again So we want to keep in mind that neurons are constantly receiving um, and integrating these inputs that they're receiving. So right, so going back to that um, figure that we had before, that the neuron 
has its cell body, but it has its dendrites. And those dendrites are going to be receiving information because they're going to be attached to these pre, um, presynaptic terminals from other cells. So they're constantly, again, receiving all this information. Um, and then that information is then going to be integrated. So some of these presynaptic terminals might be excitatory um, in nature and other ones might be inhibitory in nature. And so it's integrating all of that information to determine what the output is going to end up being, what actually goes, whether the axon is going to generate an um, action potential. And then that gets moved along the axon um, to its terminals. Okay, so there's a lot going on, and so it really becomes a sum of all this information to determine whether the axon will actually fiber or fire. Sorry. So in these panels, this is just demonstrating um, by pretty much what they would have done is done like a patch clamp um, on on a um, axon. And so what we're seeing is that generation of a membrane potential, right? And so this is information coming in from these presynaptic um, terminal ends um, into this axon. And so in panel A, we see that we're getting the generation of these membrane potentials, but they're spread out. So the combined effect is more minimal. Where in panel B, we're getting more constant signals, right? And so they have a more added or combined effect. And so this would allow us to achieve a threshold quicker, right? So then if we look in panel C, if we see, if we, if we look at that magnitude of combined um, and the frequency of firing, if we have a strong magnitude of combined, we're going to have a, a higher frequency of firing. Okay, so again, it's it's taking all the information combined, um, so it's not just the information from one synapse. It's taking the information from all the synapses um, to end up integrating and interpreting what the response should be. And the more synapses you have, um, you're going to get a stronger combined effect to reach that threshold that causes the axon to then generate an action potential. So just wanted to include this table looking at the different um, channels because, again, this is why in this chapter we were looking at um, those action potentials. Um, looking at neurons and looking at the neuromuscular junctions. Um, it's meant to give you examples of these um, channels um, and how they are regulated. And so again, I strongly recommend that if you are confused, please reach out. Um, make sure you watch the videos because the videos um, do a nice job of giving you a visual of how this process works, okay? So these are multi-step co complex processes. Um, so if I was teaching A and P, anatomy and physiology, and I was covering um, skeletal muscles, I would devote probably a good hour and a half plus just lecturing, I probably would lecture on in multiple days um, on neuromuscular junctions. Okay, so this is meant to, um, for some of you, it's more of a review if you've already taken down in physiology, but again, it's meant to give you an example of how these channels work in a biological system, okay? Um, so that it's not just um, these images of figures of, oh, they open, they close, they open, they close. Um, yeah, th there's a neurotransmitter that binds to it. Okay, so um, again, well, hopefully you take it from that approach of, of it being helpful in understanding how they work, um, not in a 
oh my god, this is another thing I have to learn and completely master and understand. Um, <laughs> so that's not the purpose. Okay. Um, so please, again, contact me if you have any questions. Thank you.